All right. Let me, 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 I know when the book of Genesis was, I want to honor in the Sabbath and going to church, going to the temple, worshiping when that began. I want to, I, I, go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. Exodus. You muted, Ron. All right. I want to say peace and shalom and blessings to everybody on this panel. Shout out to Sister Eve for inviting all of these major uh, power players in the faith on here on this one platform she's like one of the only people that could get us all together and keep us in line and in check so i appreciate the sister for that shout out to elder michael holloway pastor Renice kirkland our brother pastor kelly richardson <laughs> brother berean been waiting to get on this platform for years but anyway uh <laughs> pastor Bennett, what's going on um and uh, i just wanted to give my little feedback while uh while i'm in here I, I think this is a great discussion i mean i think there are several things that could be brought up to clarify things. The first thing I'll say to Brother Bereen, he had asked a question. He said, when was the Sabbath first instituted? Uh, well, we first see it in Exodus chapter 16, or Shemot chapter 16. And the purpose of that, it says, uh, for, the, for the children of Israel to be tested to see if they can obey the Most High's commands, right? That's when we see the situation with the manna and the quails. And that Sabbath uh, session was initially supposed to see if they were willing to obey and not collect food on the seventh day, right? The manna that came down from heaven. So it was a means of testing their obedience to a commandment. And then later on, four chapters later, it was instituted for it to be hollowed and set apart and for something to be a perpetual covenant, which we see in Exodus chapter 31, verse 16, all right? Uh, that's the first thing I wanna say. Hopefully that begins to answer that up for him, but it was a means of testing Israel to see if they were disciplined enough to obey the Most High's voice before he continues to bring them out of the land of Egypt. As we see that process started in Exodus chapter 12, all right? So what uh, that's the first thing I want to bring out. The, the okay, second thing I wanna bring remember, That doesn't mean Adam and Eve and Enoch and them came and over. That doesn't mean them. When it says remember, it don't mean, they weren't, nobody was doing it prior to Israel becoming a nation in Kemet. Uh, I don't know. There are um, commentaries in regards to uh, the rabbinic uh, traditions that say it does go back to Adam, right? And that Adam rested on the seventh day. So if you want to count those traditions as having some kind of weight, not that it's canon, but have some kind of weight to say that this was something that was already believed. Uh, to go back that far i mean we can we can discuss that as well but to answer your question it first shows up in exodus yes. chapter 16. yes thank you correct correct all right so if you want to stick strictly to the text we see in exodus 16 right however yes. if you do go into sister cultures it was keeping a sabbath mm -hmm. an example the babylonian culture was keeping the akitu festival which was a sabbath that everybody had to keep and they also had their own sabbaths that happened every month and not just them, you had Northern Mesopotamia that was also keeping rest periods. You had Canaanites that were also keeping rest periods. It just wasn't hollowed out and distinct the same way that Israel was doing it. Hence meaning this was something that was already being done in the ancient Near East, right? Um, so could that mean that when the children of Noah were scattered, they brought this element with them and it changed in different areas. And then when Mosai had to hollow Israel out from Misraim, he had to make it more legal, if you want to put it in that sense, or codify it for a theocratic society in Canaan, right? Um, so it depends on how you look at it, right? I just wanted to answer your question directly, uh, Elder uh, Berean, and then I want to move on to certain points. Another thing that's very interesting is that we mentioned Colossians chapter two and 16 a lot, right? And Colossians chapter two and 16 is supposed to be like the gold standard to say, well, see this here says you don't have to keep the Sabbath, right? Well, actually that's incorrect, right? If you go into the Greek and you look at the case ending, the suffix case ending, that is actually in the plural. Sabbaton, that's actually in the plural. So what does it mean Sabbaths? Not the definite article on the word Sabbath, that doesn't exist there. It's Sabbaths, plural. Well, you got to understand when it's tied to the feast days and new moons, guess what you had to do? You had to rest. There were Sabbaths that were connected to new moon festivals and feast. This has nothing to do with the weekly Sabbath. I don't know why people utilize this all the time for the weekly Sabbath, but it has nothing to do with the weekly Sabbath because it is connected or a conjunction that brings you to the new moon and to the feast. So the feast and the new moon, it was a day of rest. So while the feast is going on, while the new moon's there, anybody connected to Israel or within Israel, they had to rest as well. 
whether he was native born or whether he was a stranger, this has nothing to do with the weekly Sabbath because that is a second codification of commandments, which is known as the Ten Commandments. So Paul wasn't dealing with the Ten Commandments or the weekly Shabbat in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16. Now, if somebody wants to extend it to that, well, they can, but that'll be out of context. Hence, we have the previous clauses, which is the feast and new moon. And we know with those two things, you have a set apart rest day with those two elements, right? If we want to keep it within the same grammatical clause and look at how the syntax works and the case plural ending for Sabbaths there, that's extremely important, right? So I just wanted to, to kind of express what is really being said there so we don't attach a dogma to it saying that, well, this says the Sabbath. Now you can read any commentary you want, but when you go actually into the language, that doesn't change. And if we look at various manuscripts, that's consistent. We don't see the definite article there referring to the Sabbath, just like we see it's mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament, especially when Yeshua was speaking to the Pharisees. And if we go back to the Septuagint to see how it's referenced to a Hebrew traditional text to see how the Sabbath is rendered or the verbiage behind the Sabbath. That's, that's not what we have here, right? So I want to transition from that, okay? That's the second point. I'm going to make a third point and then I'll wait for my next turn because I don't want to hide everything. I want to hear what everybody else to say as well. Uh, another thing that I think is, is key also is we hear that phrase in uh, Mark chapter 2 um, during the situation where Yeshua was telling them the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. I think that's also something that's very key as well. Uh, Yeshua did not abolish the Sabbath during his time, nor did he teach for the Sabbath to be abolished afterwards, nor did any of the apostles teach that the Sabbath has been abolished at all. What we have to understand going back to the Torah, the Chumash, first five books, in regards to the weekly Sabbath, we understood that anybody that was in Israel, any stranger, whether you'd have been in the car, whether you're part of the uh, Goyim or any of those things, any kind of stranger, the guard that is in the gates, they also rested, whether you was a native born Israelite, whether you were somebody that decide I'm going to attach myself to Israel, or if you was a sojourner coming in to do business, everybody rested. So it was automatically that anytime anybody was connected to Israelites or Judeans, now we go to the first century Palestine CE, that rest would be something that they would do from their labors. And again, this is not something that is just distinct with Israel. Various cultures also rested, even after Israel's captivities. <laughs> The resting thing is an element that has been ingrained into mankind. So if we're saying that all of man comes from Noah and his sons, then we have to understand that this tradition of rest is something that also was passed down because almost every culture implemented a form of resting from labors. Now, how they viewed it, like Babylonia was different. They, they revered it. They, they feared that day as opposed to the Israelites who hallowed it or it was sanctified. But what Yeshua was saying when he said the Sabbath was made for man, when the Most High rested on the sixth day, he created the seventh day as well. He could stop with just six days, but he created a seventh day as a period of rest for something that was prophetic that was going to occur in the future with man. So he made the Sabbath for man to rest. We didn't say anything about creatures, the creeping things. We said man, the Most High created for man to rest. Therefore, that terminology, son of man, we also see it also in the book of Daniel. We see in the book of Ezekiel, the son of man refers to a mortal individual. And what he's saying is that, therefore, the son of man is even Lord or master over the Sabbath. It's because when you go into the Talmud, specifically the tractates of the Mishnah, we see that there are several chapters, about 24 chapters in regards to regulations on what to do on the Sabbath. Well, that came from the oral traditions, and the oral traditions, according to academic, can be traced back to Ezra and Nehemiah. When Ezra and Nehemiah, and after Zerubbabel and them, established the land, back into the land, the city, the walls, the temple, guess also what they did? Well, they instituted new regulations for the Sabbath, right? These new regulations was, you can't buy or sell. The gates are going to be closed. And if you in there, remember, this is a time where they're under captivity. Whoever's in the gates... If you decide you want to do something on the Sabbath and you're not resting, we're going to lay hands on you, right? So now we have additional institutions in regards to the Sabbath where some people of the rabbinical uh, tradition will say, well, that's oral tradition that he was just emphasizing. And I will say, no, 
That's something we don't see anywhere else in the text prior to Nehemiah. But you start to see a development of things that start to occur in the book of Isaiah. The children of Israel was disobeying the Sabbath. So when we get into the book of Isaiah, he starts to say to them by way of the Most High, now you must refrain from your pleasures. Because even the liberty that you were given on the Sabbath to rest from your labors, you are disregarding that. So the Most High to give more insight through Isaiah in regards to the Sabbath. And then it evolves more with Nehemiah. So when he says that the Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath, when Yah created the Sabbath for man, right? He allowed man the liberty to rest the way he saw fit. Hence why when the Pharisaic sect came about, we saw a way in which they were creating their own regulations, creating that boundary around the rest so people wouldn't be tempted to rest on the Sabbath. Therefore, he was saying that man has the ability to decide how he wants to carry out the Sabbath, but the foundational thing is to rest from labors. Gleaning from the fields is not considered occupational work. They were not breaking That's the right. Sabbath. However, if you go into the oral tradition, they would say, yeah, that is. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. The Sabbath was made for man. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Just like y'all are making these regulations, he's saying that we're going back to how it's supposed to be regulated. The poor is hungry and they're traveling and there's food in the field. They're allowed to pluck and glean because that is something that is allowed in Torah. And in Torah, it never tells you that the poor cannot do this on the Sabbath. He had to recondition their mind. And with that, I'll yield until my time comes back. Thank you so, so much. For, uh, well, the Sabbath had nothing to do with the temple. I'm sorry. Say again. You didn't because you didn't connect the Sabbath with worship, so it has nothing to do with worship. Well, Sabbath. There is a doxology in the Sabbath. Oh, when, yeah. When, when, when was this? When was this? So, so, so when when we talk about worship, you have to define what worship is, right? Worship. If we just look at it in the Hebrew or the Greek, it means full prostration and surrenderance to a power that's greater than you, right? So. If we are surrendering ourselves to the Most High and in the Ten Commandments, he's hollowed out the Sabbath and then re-emphasize it as a perpetual covenant with the children of Israel in Exodus chapter 31 and 16. That is how we show worship towards Yah. If he hollowed something for me, I'm going to honor that which he has given me. Why would I dishonor it? He allowed me to have that period of reference that it is sanctified. It is set apart. It is cold death. So when the world sees you, they know that you are still keeping the covenant that I made with you, Israel. This is how we worship Yah. This is like when we, when I go on Sundays, and this is just me going to pastor has been the seminary when I used to go to church in the past. They said, no, we hallow this, this Sunday, the first day of the week, the Lord's day. That is the day of our rest. That's the day that we worship. Hence, where they're connecting worship to Sunday, where they're not working, because if you work, you can't go to church. So they hallow this, this Sunday, which is the Lord's day, and then they do their worship. And then the form of worship is their doxology. Whatever they do within that period of time is how they show their honor to the most high. We're just keeping it from an ethnic perspective of cultural mandate in regards to the law. And any, and this is how I rock. Everybody's different. Any Gentiles that will be in my house, they're going to have to rest on the Sabbath. Any Gentiles that come into the congregation where I'm at, they're going to have to rest on the same thing that we rest. That is how it was believed to be done. Now, if anybody's outside of that, I can't enforce that. I can't tell them what to do. I can't tell them. They, they have the liberty to do whatever they please, and Yah will judge them. But I have refused to break the foundational commandments, which are the Ten Commandments, that Yah instituted in Exodus chapter 20 for something that is, even if you don't believe that, oh, we should have this period of rest, that is even best practice in regards to things that are universal to his kingdom, the foundation of his kingdom, that he used Israel to teach the rest of the world, like we see in Romans chapter 3, what vantage of it to be a Jew, much in every way. They were entrusted with the oracles. Well, if I'm entrusted with an oracle, which is the direct revelation of Yah, then why would I cease part of that oracle, which would be the Sabbath, and tell others don't do it? That is me doing the least, teaching the least. Therefore, I will be least in the kingdom. So I'm going to take Yeshua's words, and I'm going to refrain myself from being the least in the kingdom. I want to make my father proud. All right. So what if, for example, you still argue, you argued the Sabbath for Israel. Yes. <laughs> I'm a good yeah, I, I understand that. Oh, <laughs> but okay. some people but wait, but some people will say I'm that, sure what that part of, the, of the conversation you came in because a little earlier I was asking if it was us. Are we in sin? My brother, I see yes. you as an Israelite. Okay. I see Elder Mike Holloway as an Israelite. I see Pastor Bennett as an Israelite. So my standpoint and my 
the way I deliberate is going to be that I see y'all as Israelites. And then I would that's just right. be concerned as to why the most highs people. And again, that's from my vantage point. If you want to argue whether we're Israelites or not, we could do that. But from my perspective, I'm saying I say that we should keep the Sabbath as a way of honoring the most high. I don't see how the Sabbath can take you away from Yeshua. The Sabbath is even a reminder for those in Hebrews chapter four, when he says that he would have given Israel that rest, which was the land, not the weekly Sabbath. Joshua could not give them that rest because they were rebellious and disobedient. So Yeshua came to give a spiritual rest that you can lay your burdens down spiritually and rest in Yeshua. And that way, if we keep the weekly Sabbath, it can also remind us of the spiritual rest we have in Yeshua. So I don't even see how as best practice, keeping the Sabbath is gonna take anybody away from honoring Yeshua as the Messiah, whether you are Jew or Gentile. That's just my perspective, that's all. Okay, I'm sorry, and so I'm gonna, I'm, and I'm gonna leave y'all. Look at brother Ron, I'm gonna leave y'all. I'm gonna throw something out of Pastor Mike. I'm gonna throw something out of Pastor Mike. I'm gonna mark that down right here. <laughs> oh, there's some good stuff right here. Cool. It is, man. I'm glad you took the hat off, because now if you sweat, we could see it, all right? So, uh, <laughs> that's how we know we get into him. That's how we know we get into him, all right? So, <laughs> all right, so, um, all right, so the, uh, the I think the thing that that needs to be addressed uh, also is um, Elder Mike Holloway uh, had made a reference in regards to all of the early patristic sources that we have going back to the Dia uh, decade in regards to um, the Lord's Day, right? So what I'm going to do for everybody that's in the chat, I'm going to drop a link in the chat so you guys can actually go to it yourself. I have a couple books on it, but this website, it gives you all those quotations um, in chronological order, right? So you can see it. One thing that you see is a constant thread, and I think he cleared it up a little bit, is that they were not saying that the Lord's Day and the Sabbath day was gone because the Lord's Day was here. The Lord's Day was a day that was set apart because it became traditional to come together and break bread. We see Shaul doing that as well, telling them, hey, get the monies together on the next day Lord, after the Lord, Sabbath Lord. so that we could give it for relief to the brothers and sisters that are doing ministries in areas where they're being persecuted and he wanted them to do this consistently because it made it easy for him to get it and go because paul was always on the go right um also it became a day that this was a hollow day after the sabbath because that's when they discovered that yeshua was gone nobody went there on the sabbath so they didn't see that he was gone but on the sabbath early in the morning we saw he was already gone right so they kept that day as a reminder to them to set aside to break bread and to honor the work of Yeshua. Nobody ever said in those quotes from what I could see that this replaces the Sabbath day. They're just saying that this is something that they hollowed because we don't see anywhere that Yeshua said hollow the, the Sabbath, the Sunday as a day. And remember to me, he never said that. The Most High never taught that. We never see that. So it was a tradition that developed among men. It was not something commanded by Yeshua and it wasn't commanded by the Most High. And, I, and we all can agree with that. You know what I'm saying? So this is, you know, individuals that even lived in an earlier time that decided that we're going to set this time aside because this is when we believe Yeshua resurrected. And the reason why we see that amongst the Yahunin community is because of what we read in the book of Revelation, right? Revelation chapter one, it says, then when I was by myself on the Lord's day, I turned around and looked and behold, right? That phrase right there, it got connected to the resurrection day in the Christian community being the sun, the day of Sunday or the first day of the week. And that became hollowed amongst that community. Yeshua never said to hollow it in the book of Revelation when he was speaking to John. He never said it while he's walking the earth. And the Most High never gave that commandment for man to do. So even if it's tradition, is it scriptural in regards to it being hollowed by the Most High or Yeshua? It was not. So even though brothers and sisters want to keep that, that's fine. But they cannot say that that's a command from Yah. That's a, even a new command. Yeshua said, I give you a new command. Love each other, your neighbor, as you love yourself. He never said, and then when I die, because remember, while he was alive, he told the disciples, hey, in three days, I'm going to be handed over to you know, the Pharisees, and I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to raise up. And he said, but don't tell nobody. They was like, what is this guy talking about? This guy's bugging out. He never said, and then when I come back, you'll keep the Lord's day for me. He came to them in John chapter 21, a whole chapter where he's chilling with them. He never said, now that I've resurrected and I'm appearing to y'all, I need you to hollow Sunday. And remember it to me. He never said that. In Acts chapter 1, he was still speaking with them before he was taken up in the clouds. He never said to them, make sure you guys hollow Sunday after me. He never said that. So we can admit that it's not rooted in a command from Yeshua, nor is it rooted in a command from the Most High. But it was a tradition that developed because of an act or an event that was critical to the development of the church, right? 
The second thing I want to say is, uh, Brother Brian asks where there are Christians keeping the Sabbath in the first, second, and third century, up to the fourth century. Yes, we have various Jewish Christians. Matter of fact, I have a book in case anybody's interested, you can read the book that goes in and tells you everything about these Jewish Christians, all the various sects, and all of them kept the law, all of them kept the Sabbath, and all of them accepted Yeshua as the Messiah. The problem with that is it became unfathomable to other groups of Christianity and say, wait, how can I keep the law? And then how can they keep Yeshua as the Messiah when he was supposed to do it with the law? It has been a schism of misunderstanding that has happened throughout the ages. And it became so deep that that Jewish Christians who were the third wheel, because you had the Jews and the Christians, both groups did what? Got rid of that middle group. Said, look, either you convert here or there, or you're going to be persecuted, excommunicated, or we're going to burn you at the stake. We have all the records of this. You talking about the Indianites? Who are you talking about? What book are you talking about right there, brother? Let me throw it up on the screen for y'all, because you know I always got tons of references, man. I want to, I want to show this when I was talking yesterday. All right, so take a look at my screen. Can I share my screen real quick, um, Sister E? And I just want to get through my few points after I share it. You can, you can, All right, you can share. I do have to give you rights to share. You Sis, listen, I have to ask permission. This is your platform. I honor whoever's platform this is, so I have to ask. You know what I'm saying? So here on the screen right here, your, anybody can get this book. It's called The Early Christians, Jewish Believers, and Jesus. This book is several hundred pages long. It's an excellent read, and I would recommend anybody to get it if they want to look more into the subject matter. Another book here is called Nazarene Jewish Christianity from the end of the New Testament period until its disappearance in the fourth century. And there's tons of other books. Matter of fact, here's another great book. Y'all want to see? Look at this. The Halakha of Jesus of Nazareth according to the Gospel of Matthew. Well, why is this even important? Well, when it comes to the Sabbath, guess what Yeshua was teaching? A form of Midrash Halakha. <laughs> Look at this right here. I'm going to zoom it in for you so you can go ahead and take a look at it for yourselves. Look at this. It says the Matthean Jesus and the Holocaust of divorce. If you go up right here, it goes into the history of Holocaust activity. And if we go down on page 145, it talks about the Sabbath Holocaust. It goes into plucking and picking and rubbing, healing on the Sabbath. It goes into various sources, Pentateuchal and extra Pentecostal Sabbath Holocaust sources in regards to understanding the Sabbath. And this is written by academia. You can anybody get this book if you want to let me know. I send it over to you. So when you research the pedigree, the Israelite pedigree today that should be connected to the groups that kept the law and accepted Yeshua, there were groups that were there. They existed for at least 300 years. But when imperial money started to support a form of orthodox Christianity, those groups got wiped out. All right. The third point I want to make is um, I, I heard a mention that Sabbaton was in reference also to the weekly Sabbaths in the plural. If anybody has which scriptures that is, please share it with me so that we can enlighten me on it and I can go back and parse it out in the Greek to see if what I statement I made was incorrect or inconclusive or what you were saying was correct. I'm, I'm open to correction. Please send me that scripture. Anybody when we go back around. And the last two points I want to make is in regards to this issue with uh, keeping the Sabbath and somebody got stoned with sticks. OK, well, the initial implementation of this had to be severe so that way the Israelites can take the most high seriously when they went into the land so they can execute his form of judgment against the sin of the Amorites that was pervasive through all of Canaan that had to be wiped out. He had to test them to make sure that they was going to keep the Sabbath, they was going to obey his commandments, and when they didn't, he kept them there for 40 years so he found a generation that would. And even that generation had to get circumcised before they can get the victory. That's another lesson altogether. I did a sermon on that. So let's move forward, right? Here's the important thing when we understand that. Yah says very clearly in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6. This is important. I don't know why my brothers in Christianity tend to miss the scriptures in regards to the attributes and character of the Most High. What does he say in Exodus chapter 34 verse 6? Can somebody, can somebody be my, my second Israelite reader? Even if you're a Christian, it's okay. I just want somebody to read that for me real quick. Anybody want to read that for me? Anybody got their sword, Michael Holloway? It looks like you're looking at your Bible right there. Yeah. You want to read that for me? Are you ready? Yeah, read 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 like you are required to read it like this. Oh, okay. I mean, my, my Israel life. Let's not miss this when yeah. it comes to the most high who he is. Anybody exactly. can read that. All right. I'll read it. 34 and 6. Yes, verse 6. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. That's right. Now, look, watch this. He said something key. What is he telling Moses his attributes was? Can you say that one more time, Brother Berean? What was his attributes? 
and six and the merciful, gracious, long suffering, Great. abundant, and goodness and truth. Oh, so if the most, if this is the most high's character, that he is merciful, he is gracious, he is long suffering. So don't you think when he's dealing with his children, he'll understand they're gonna get to a point where they may be disobeying the law, where they all should be put to death, but yet he spares their life. We see it happen when King David and Bathsheba, he got a man killed. It was conspiracy of murder. He should have been put to death. He didn't get put to death. He committed adultery with another man's wife while that man was still alive and tried to get that man to go sleep and an unclean woman. He tried to do all these things, but did the most High take his life? No, 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 no. David repented when his sins was confronted to him by Nathan the prophet. And as a result, the Most High spared his life. That man should have been killed, but he was spared. His child was taken as a result or consequence of his sin, but David was allowed to live. And in Psalm 51, he expresses what is the character of Yah. I will give bulls and goats if I can wipe away this sin. But the Most High does not desire that. He desires a contrite heart, a broken spirit. And these are the things that he will receive. So when we get to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter one, where the children of Israel is laden with sin. What does he say to the children of Israel? He says this. I'm going to go ahead and say it. He says um, in verse, I saw that in verse four. At last, oh, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evil doers, children of depravity. They have forsaken yod Wafe. They have despised the Holy One of Israel and have turned their backs on him. But you know what the Most High says, because his character, which is innate, the thing that is immutable, the thing that cannot change. He is gracious. He is merciful. He is long-suffering. You know what he says to them? Come and let us reason together, says Yah. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they will become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. The Yah is looking at the heart. Or you have a heart of rebellion when you sin and you're going to continue on in that nature of sin? Or will you turn to me? Because if you do, my mercy surpasses even the law I gave to rule this nation. And I'm willing to make exceptions for those who have a heart toward Jah. And the most I said, David was after his heart. So the Israelites that are here, we understand that the law itself is not going to drive righteousness because if so, David would have gave those bulls and gave those goats. But he taught us something to know for those who are keeping Torah, Yah requires a willful an obedient heart after the fact of something that you should die for. And yes, we came to pay that penalty so we can continue to speak today. And with that, I you yield. Right, What's, What's your cash app? Right, What's your I'm, I'm about to hit the, I'm about to hit the, 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 the B flat. I'm about to do my core progressions now. And the king, 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 I want to say thank you, Sis E, for allowing me on the panel, allowing me to be on here with such heavy hitters, brothers and sisters that have the compassion and love to build and edify, right? Paul says that, right? He said, love is what? Is that which edifies, builds up. It doesn't puff up, it's that which builds up. So if we are here to edify, to build, to learn, to grow as a collective, then we are exemplifying the love that was put forth in the text that we need to embody today. So I think the most high that we all have that spirit, that ruach, that numa to say you, my brother, my sister, before anything, even in the midst of a disagreement. Um, with that said, I just want to respond to a few things that Pastor yeah. Bennett said, and then I'm, I'm signing out and I'm done. Um, first thing I want to say is I, I, I encourage all my Christian brothers and sisters to go back and read the Talmud. If you have not read the Talmud, then you don't understand the Sahedrin decision that makes up the Mishnah to understand what are the additional regulations that they have given to put a boundary on hallowing the Sabbath. And if you don't understand Midrash Halakha, and the, which is the methodology they use to extract from the written Torah, couple it with traditional Torah, which is the oral, and be able to put forth a ruling that then gets encapsulated in 200 CE in order for it to stay with the Pharisaic set and all Jews, et cetera, you don't understand what these additional excessive adherence elements of the law that was placed there on the written law, right? So this is what legalism is, is the excessive adherence. And what you do is you add additional stipulations and regulations. And this is what Yeshua was speaking against. So it's not that, okay, well, this is their own interpretation of law. No, that they use a particular method 
to extract the implicit, make it explicit, and make it a ruling dependent upon the cases in which they adjudicated over so that this could be something that the community would adhere to to refrain them from breaking anything from uh, keeping the people from hollowing the Sabbath. So I encourage you guys to do that. If not, you can go online and check it out for yourself. There's a website that you can go and look at the Talmud. It's called sepharia.org. And in there, just type in the Shabbat and you'll see the 24 tractates on the Shabbat. And you'll understand these things. Go back into Rambam and those other sages and look at the Midrash Halakha that they also executed to understand the additional things that should be refrained upon on the Sabbath. These things are not in the Chumash, the first five books of the Torah. It's not there. Hence why Yeshua said that man, that the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath because he took an opportunity to create these additional things with the Sabbath because the Most High gave the Sabbath to man. So man is ruling over the Sabbath because remember, the Most High gave man dominion over everything under Adam. So the Sabbath was also given to man to also rule. And this is one of the principles that the Pharisees utilized. This is when you study the Talmud and, and the rabbinic sages and the Pharisees. This is why they added the additional regulations because of the principle that Yeshua reminded them of. See, if you don't understand these things, the backdrop before you read the narrative, then you're going to say, oh, okay, well, is this because they interpreted the law this way? And this, he mentioned a principle. I gave you a book that deals with the Halakha of Jesus. If you read that, they go in depth in regards to that and they explain this to you, right? That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing is, when the the, the uh, scripture was brought up in Matthew chapter 12 in regards to the necessity to eat, the necessity to eat, not the the uh, uh, excessiveness to want to eat, not a gluttony spirit, not a disregard. When the mention of David eating the showbread, it was in a context. The context is they were hungry. And remember, they left their occupational jobs to follow Yeshua. They're not out here fishing no more. He said, look, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. That's why when he commissioned them in Matthew chapter 10, he said, don't bring no script, no purse. Wherever you go, that's where you'll be taken care of. It's a context. So therefore, they had nothing on them. They, they rejected their occupational duty. So when they follow Torah, a law that says you can glean from the fields, it's not their occupational work. They had to do it out of necessity to eat. When David went in and ate the showbread, he knew he wasn't supposed to do that. But guess what? It was out of necessity to survive. And guess who had mercy on him? The Most High. It's interesting because That's we also right. see that David was inducted into the order of Melchizedek. That's something totally separate because that would necessitate him being a priesthood that was above what the Levites were doing. They just didn't understand. The text even says that David's sons was Kohanim or they were also priests, but we're not going to dive into that. I just want people to read context. If you don't understand the context of the text, you have to read extra biblically for additional context so you know what is taking place in the text. If not, we're all going to give our individual interpretations. You must learn the language as well. Know the culture is a book called Manners and Customs. Get that book if you don't have it. The Cultural Background uh, Study Bible. Get that if you don't have that. These are all books that will give you context to understand what is going on in a custom, cultural, historical manner so you understand what is going on. The last one I want to make is when we talk about mercy in the Old Testament and New Testament, I think people forgot about Acts chapter 5. I really do think they forgot about it. I don't think they forgot about it just to be spiteful. But in Acts chapter 5, somebody got killed for disobeying. Did y'all know that? Did you know the Holy Spirit? Because once somebody pronounced that you disobeyed Ananias and what you did, you kept apart. The and therefore, we asked you about it. You lied. Guess what happened? Ain't no grace for you, my brother. The Holy Spirit took your behind out. So how come the Most High is dealing out retribution for breaking commandments? Even in the New Testament, let's not just act like this is a deity that just came about in the New Testament. He's, he never changes. He's not the son of man. He's not a man that he shall lie. He is immutable. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So therefore, if people do not obey the commandments, they will drop dead, just like they did in the Old Testament. Instead of you getting stoned, because now you're under a, another uh, oppressor or a captive, so you have to go through certain procedures before somebody can get killed according to your law, they were not a theocratic sovereign state anymore. We got to keep this in mind. And with that being said, now the Holy Spirit is like, okay, I'm just going to take people out. I'm just going to kill people for disobeying the law. So where's the grace for Ananias then? How come he didn't get an opportunity to get that grace there? You know why? Because it's up to Yah to make the exceptions, not man. And this is something that was in continuity from the Tanakh to the Brit Hadashah. It didn't change. The problem is Christians never center on Ananias getting dropped dead, him and his wife. Both of them died. How come nobody talks about that? 
What was the grace and the mercy for them there? It's because it's up to Yah to enforce these things. He uses people to enforce things and or he'll jump in himself and do it. We saw that happen with Onan. Onan to keep the Levite marriage uh, rules that we then see show up later. Where? In the Mosaic law? Well, the Mosai took him out, killed him. Well, we see the same thing with Ananias. He didn't do what he was obligated to do, and he got taken out. So let's just keep in the context that the Mosai is the same. We see examples of his retribution and his wrath in the New Testament, just like we see in the Old Testament. You break my commandments in the Old Testament, you get put to death, but I can step in and make exceptions. And the New Testament, if you do the same, I can come in and kill you, or you know what? I can step back, and I can work with you. Paul should have died. Paul persecuted and killed several men of the church. Mosai should have allowed him to be taken out for that. But you know what? It was his grace. He, he preserved Paul. He said, Paul, I'm going to use you for something else, even though you kill people, Paul. And that was, they were right for getting mad at you. You got people arrested, locked them, and possibly even killed. The Most High show grace. He's, he's been doing this consistently. So let's stop trying to disconnect the Most High from the New Testament and the Old Testament or the Old Testament and the New Testament because he's the same forevermore. And that's the only thing I wanted to leave with because context, looking at extra biblical data, and also learning the language and understanding the immutable character of the Most High. He said to Moses in Exodus chapter uh, 23, he said, Yahweh, Yahweh, or Yahuwah, Yahuwah. What did he say? He said, grace is merciful, long-suffering. This is the character of Yah, and the Son only came to do what the Father told him to do. So his character, if you see me, you see the Father, I have the same character that the Father has. Don't get it twisted. Don't think it changed. And I'm the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. And with that, I say shalom and thank you, family. Blessings to the rest of my Christian friends. And if anything that I could do to help you guys out with, email me and I'm here to help and to serve. Shalom.